Now, when we talk about the subject of Roman Catholicism, one of the best ways to make yourself extremely unpopular today is to say anything about the subject, to take a stand that we need to evangelize Roman Catholics, is to guarantee uh, that you will remain a small ministry for as long as you are in existence. We obviously have taken that stand over the years, have engaged in many debates with Roman Catholics. It was only a couple years ago that I finally had done more debates with Muslims than I had done with Roman Catholics, mainly because Roman Catholics just generally won't debate anymore, at least not the ones that are the best known. They used debate as a means of establishing a foundation, but now they've got EWTN and their television stuff and everything else, uh, not, not much interest in doing serious debate any longer. But as a result, there is a tremendous amount of confusion amongst Christians and specifically amongst serious Bible-believing Christians that take the Bible seriously and that believe that the Christian faith is divinely revealed by God, that we have a sure word from God by people who want to know what the truth is. There's still a tremendous amount of confusion as to how we should relate and how we should um, encounter Roman Catholicism. And I've been saying a lot recently that as persecution comes against all forms of, well, anything other than the totalitarian views of the coming socialist state, um, we will be pushed closer and closer to one another. We will have to be dealing with these issues more and more. And if we do not have a sound foundation within our own personal convictions as to whether the gospel does or does not define the Christian faith, we will truly struggle to give a meaningful in, uh, answer for how we interact with the Roman, with the Roman Catholic Church. As a result, I have been warning for a long time, at least a decade, at least a decade, about what's called the Mere Christianity Movement. The Mere Christianity Movement, which you see uh, with, with very major names within what is generally called evangelicalism, whatever that means, um, that that Mere Christianity Movement basically says that if you've got the core of the Christian faith, Trinity, hence the deity of Christ, though some, I think, waffle a little bit of the personality of the Holy Spirit, um, the cross and the resurrection. That's pretty much it. Now, to the mere Christianity folks, you can't ask the question, what is the relationship between all these things? You can't ask whether the gospel is Trinitarian. You can't ask what the death of Christ actually accomplishes. You just boil everything down to this teeny tiny little center. And as long as you've got that, then the rest is just fodder for discussion over a Starbucks coffee. But it's not definitional of the faith. What's most important here is, of course, that the gospel itself becomes something that is on the side. Good men disagree. Uh, but hey, as long as we're Trinitarians, and as long as we believe in the resurrection, we're good. It's, uh, it's all I need to... I'll, I'll, that, that's it. And so, within the apologetics community some very, very big names now have come straight out and they've said, hey, as long as you believe these things, whether you're a Catholic, uh, Eastern Orthodox, uh, whatever you are, as long as, you, as we've got this, this teeny tiny core, um, then you're my brother and sister in Christ. So in other words, big names have taken the stand that the gospel itself is not definitional of the Christian faith. You can have absolutely, not just slight different differences, but absolutely competing differences that historically were seen as other gospels. Uh, don't have to worry about that anymore. The gospel 
does not define the Christian faith. The gospel is an ancillary thing. Uh, we can disagree about whether a person is justified by grace alone, through faith alone, uh, or by grace through faith. Those alones being very important. Big names. It's becoming extremely popular. In fact, to, to stand against this is to pretty much make sure you're going to be marginalized when it comes to the, um, the big conferences. Uh, now, of course, there are big conferences on both sides of this, but the big apologetics conferences. Uh, the big theology conferences, not so much. But the big apologetics conferences, uh, I am simply not invited to the vast majority of them. Doesn't matter what my experience is. Doesn't matter where I've debated or who I've debated. It's irrelevant. Um, there is a strong uh, commitment amongst many of these folks to maintaining the safe position of paddling around in the middle of the Tiber River. And joined with this then is a generally strong commitment to a synergistic view of salvation. If you're a monergist, um, you, you sort of need to keep that to yourself. You can say it in some context, but you need to sort of prove uh, to the gatekeepers that uh, you won't bring that up in inappropriate contexts, basically. Roman Catholicism. Here is another quote that I read many, many years ago. It's from John O'Brien, his popular work, The Faith of Millions. He wrote the following. When the priest announces the tremendous words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens, bringing Christ down from his throne, and places him upon our altar to be offered up again as the victim for the sins of man. It is a power greater than that of saints and angels, greater than that of seraphim and cherubim. Indeed, it is greater even than the power of the Virgin Mary. While the Blessed Virgin was the human agency by which Christ became incarnate a single time, the priest brings Christ down from heaven and renders him present on our altar as the eternal victim for the sins of man, not once but a thousand times. The priest speaks, and lo, Christ, the eternal and omnipotent God, bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. Of what sublime dignity is the office of the Christian priest, who is thus privileged to act as the ambassador and the vicegerent of Christ on earth. He continues the essential ministry of Christ. He teaches the faithful with the authority of Christ. He pardons the penitent sinner with the power of Christ. He offers up again the same sacrifice of adoration and atonement which Christ offered on Calvary. No wonder that the name which spiritual writers are especially fond of applying to the priest is that of Alter Christus. For the priest is and should be another Christ. Alter Christus is the Latin for another Christ. That's what it means. And if you will take the time to go listen to my debate with Mitchell Pacwa on the priesthood, I raised the issue of Alter Christus, and he affirmed without embarrassment that in his ordination vows he was called Alter Christus, and that he embraces that as well. A week ago, Friday, I was driving home and I, once in a while, I'll be honest with you, I, I just get tired of all the political stuff on radio. And um, so there is a Roman Catholic station here in the Valley, EWTN. And so I tuned over to Catholic Answers Live, and they had a guy on whose ministry is uh, basically, uh, as I recall, his website's called Unashamed Popery. And the question was the issue of the sacrifice of the Mass. Now, according to the Universal Catechism of the Catholic Church, which, you know, today the question is, what really represents Rome? Uh, does Pope Frankie? Well, yeah, he's the Pope. Does Pope Frankie believe everything in here? I, I, 
I don't think he believes everything in here as it was intended by the authors of who wrote it. Uh, it there isn't any there is not a single question in my mind. And I don't think there can be a single question in the mind of any honest person, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, that Francis and Benedict believe very different things on a number of issues. Well, there's, there's, you know, you can you can try as you may. It's just any question about it. In brief, in regards to the Mass, the Eucharist is the heart and the summit of the Church's life. For in it, Christ associates his church and all her members with her sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving offered once for all on the cross to his Father. By this sacrifice, he pours out the graces of salvation on his body, which is the church. By the consecration, the transubstantiation of the bread and wine of the body and blood of Christ is brought about. Under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in a true, real, and substantial manner, his body and his blood with his soul and his, his divinity. And reference is made directly to the Council of Trent at that point, for those people uh, who think that the Council of Trent has become irrelevant. As sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead and to obtain spiritual and temporal benefits from God. Because Christ himself is present in the sacrament of the altar, he is to be honored with the worship of adoration. To visit the blessed sacrament is a proof of gratitude and expression of love and a duty of adoration toward Christ our Lord. In case you're wondering what that's talking about, that's why the Roman Catholic bows and genuflects upon entering into the sanctuary because God is physically present in the tabernacle or the monstrance because of the miracle of transubstantiation. That wafer has become God, has become Jesus, body, soul, blood, and divinity, at the command of the consecrated priest. Is this some side issue? Can anyone seriously say, who has seriously considered their theology, that the difference between an evangelical and a Roman Catholic is the same as between, say, an evangelical and a Presbyterian? Well, that's what William Lane Craig says. William Lane Craig, I have said many times before, is a philosopher whose theology has been determined by his philosophical commitments. He is not a theologian, he is not an exegete. And this past weekend, as I was traveling to California, I was directed to a question and answer period. It's 12 minutes long, wherein William Lane Craig addresses the issue of Roman Catholicism. That's what we're working toward here. These issues, priesthood, mass, sacrifice, you just... I just read from the Universal Catechism of the Catholic Church, the summit of the life of the church. This is the central act of worship in the church. In the Roman church is the Eucharistic sacrifice. Christ, present, bow before him. Priest has the ability to turn bread and wine into the body, soul, blood, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So much so, and I had heard this before, but this expression of it on the Catholic Answers Live program was amazing. When a Roman Catholic priest is ordained, a mark is placed upon his soul. An ontological change takes place in a man's soul that cannot be undone. Even if he is defrocked, even if he's kicked out of the church, he continues to be a priest till the day he dies. And he continues to have the special, unique, sacramental capacity of working the miracle of transubstantiation. 